Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Hi, everyone. This is Jewish Talk coming to you live from NASA Community College, 90.3 WHBC, streaming live on the College Station, iHeart, and the iTunes.com. This program is re- uh, podcasted on Spreaker. Dot com. Don't forget, you can join us right now in the studio. Hello, I'm waving to everybody out there on Facebook Live. Also, good news, we we'll rebroadcast every Sunday evening at 11 p.m. each week on Sunday night. So you can get a chance to listen to us again, or if you're listening to us for the first time, welcome. Hi there, my name is Rabbi Pearl, and I'm looking forward to being with you and discussing and saying hello to everybody. Hello to Harvey Kipnis, to Gene Brandestein and Jonathan Wolf, and to Dr. Kilshevsky and everybody out there. First of all, I want to bring to your attention that today in 1826, right? 1826, this is the day when Rabbi Dov Bev Lubavitch, that is the second of the seven Chabad Rebbe's, the second one, he was the son of the first, uh, uh, first of the first Chabad Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe, he was um, arrested on charges that his teachings were threatening the authority of the Tsar. Can you imagine? This is going back to the 1800s. Well, on this very day, uh, he was exonerated and freed. So this is the date. Today is the Kislev the 10th, and it's celebrated in the Chabad Hasidim amongst us as a festival of liberation, of Chag Hagula. We don't say Tachnun today, and uh, Fabrengens are held and of course, teachings of the uh, of the uh, as he was called the Mittler Rebbe Rabdov Bear, his teachings are shared. So I thought on this occasion, uh, we would have Alpha Brengen here and uh, discuss in an interesting uh, perspective of what is Torah's view on prison. Right, this is the day when the second Chabad Rebbe was released from prison. But what does Torah have to say about a prison? You see, the Torah's concept of prison. Uh, has really has no concept. Torah has no concept of prison as a punishment. Why? Because, to put it bluntly, my friends, prison is a futile place. A place where you're told you must be here, you must not change what place this is, you grow older, but you must not change uh, in your life, you, uh, you will live, but you will not give life. You see, being a, a, a living human being means you must make change in this world. You must take charge of this life and must give life to others. So in a broader sense, we're going to go into it more deeply, but in a broader sense, each of us find ourselves in prison. What do I mean? What am I talking about? There are times when God puts the soul, putting a soul into our body to be born, right? Taking a very lofty soul, and putting into a body is a form of prison. Because the soul was all spiritual, all glowing, all revealing. And now it's put into a very, and kind of into a vice. Right? It's squeezed um, with, uh, into, a, into a body. But guess what? The purpose of being put into, the, into, the, uh, into a body, kind of imprisoned inside the body, puts us under a squeeze. A squeeze which... Um, brings out the best inside of us. You see, because even though God, in a sense, locks us up, the purpose of being alive is to be able to kind of free oneself. How does one free oneself? That, of course, is through Torah and its mitzvahs. But let's, let's go to the actual discussion itself. Incarceration as a modality of punishment and rehabilitation. Every civilization throughout history has uh, promulgated rules providing for the punishment of those who offend society's norms. The history of criminal justice is filled with societies that have included the practice of incarceration as one form of, of such punishment, which arguably vary with various degrees of success. But guess what, my friends? The concept of prison appears nowhere in Judaism. Under the American criminal justice system, we have incarcerated more than two million of our fellow citizens in federal, state, and county facilities. 
Prison building has been described as one of the growth industries of the decade. Yet, the concept of prison appears nowhere in Judaism. Indeed, while sentencing options are diverse, as uh, we have financial penalties, atonement offerings, uh, even uh, a capital punishment, and even death directed by the hand of God, that is found in the Torah, the concept of punishment incarcerating somebody uh, is nowhere to be found in Torah-based Jewish law. Now, if you read a careful reading of the Torah sources, reveals that where the Torah refers to prisons, they're not sanctioned modes of, of simply for punishment. These uh, there are prisons established by non-Jewish societies. Let's say, for example, in Joseph's imprisonment in jails, right? We find him. It was in Pharaoh's jails. Prisons created a, uh, a, a, complete, a completely opposite than Jewish law. And other, other times like that. Now, there's not to say that Jewish law does not condone restrictions on a person's liberty. Because the Bible itself, the Torah itself, provides for involuntary servitude imposed by the court as a, a reparative kind of form of incarceration. So under certain circumstances, the court could order that a perpetrator of, of theft could be sold for a period of time, not to exceed seven years, in order to be able to raise the funds necessary for restitution. Yet such court-imposed servitude could not degenerate into cruel slave labor. The bondsman was entitled by law to good uh, nutrition, proper clothing, productive work, and food and shelter for his wife and children. So restitution was the, was the point, not punishment. That was the goal of restitution. Another, fi- another form of restitution, of, of, in a certain sense, of restricted liberty, which is often misunderstood as prisons by those who uh, study the Torah, were called the Ore Miklot, the cities of refuge three of which were established by Moses just prior to the Jewish people entering the Holy Land after wandering through the desert for 40 years. And then the three others were established by Joshua after he settled the land. Now these cities were in fact the earliest known form of protective custody. Guess what? Persons who were found guilty of unpremeditated murder were given the option of moving into one of what eventually were these six cities, thereby escaping from the lawful revenge of the victim's surviving relatives. But the cities of refuge, under no stretch of the imagination, could be functioned in any way similar to be compared to today's prisons. For one thing, the offender was not isolated from contact with his loved ones and outside contacts. These environments were penal um, colonies that had all the functions of a community, including productive work. Indeed, once the offender chose to flee to one of these cities, the court would order the inmate's wife, children, and teacher to accommodate him. So the, uh, the underlying p- purpose of these cities of refuge was atonement, not isolation. So a clear indication that the Torah does not advocate the use of prisons is in fact that while the scripture deals in the you know, minor, in the very, very minutest details of, that, with all punishment, um, with all kinds of things, there's absolutely no guidance to be found with respect to simply punitive incarceration. I'll tell you why. Because prison is contrary to the creation's purpose, as I mentioned earlier on. The Jewish tradition teaches that everything in this universe was created by God with a positive purpose. To be used, to be utilized completely without waste. Accordingly, in the criminal justice system, punishments should affect direct results and benefits for all parties involved. The perpetrator, the victim, and the society in general. For for the criminal, the consequential punishment of crime should bring penance, atonement, rehabilitation, and of course, ultimate purging. After being purging, One starts a fresh slate. Jewish law dictates that the community must accept the wrongdoer as before and and he regains a place in the world to come after he's done his restitution. For the victim and society, punishment must serve the goals such as restitution, deterrence, 
retribution, and of course protection. Imprisonment does not serve these functions. It's, it certainly brings no benefit or short or long term to the victim. It appears to offer only temporary benefit to society, right? The guy's taken away. It obviously does no good for the inmate. On the contrary, prisons inhibits and limits man's potential, destroys families, breeds bitterness, anger, insensitivity, and sadly, as I know, eventual return, right? Or the fancy word of recidivism. I go to the Nassau County jails each week for both the men and the women. And wonderful, wonderful people out there, including Malka, Malka Kipnis, make sure that those men and women receive a taste of Shabbos. Chalas and grape juice are provided each week while they're sitting there in jail. Why? Because deep down, we all want to make sure those who find themselves in jail should have the opportunity to rehabilitate themselves and to reconnect to their roots. So when imprisonment affords the opportunity for rehabilitation, a reconstructing of the offender's values, priorities, lifestyle, then a valid purpose can be established and realized. And therefore I take the opportunity to thank Malka and Harvey for providing this extraordinary uh, mitzvah. See, for serious and proper rehabilitation, which is called teshuva, or return in the Jewish tradition, there are two necessary requirements. First, one must gain a true understanding and acceptance of one's present state of being an undesirable. Second, one must develop a firm and disciplined resolve to change and improve. Both remorse for the past and resolutions for the future are required. In the prison environment, where one is separated from society, and sheds much of the external uh, aspects of society, the pressures and the facades, one may begin a realistic and objective evaluation of oneself and really structure a pattern of improvement. So, the disciplining forces of Jewishness, the commandments referred to as mitzvahs, give a person, number one, the mechanism to create control devices for his or her actions even to extent of becoming, affecting one's habits. Number two, regulation in structural balanced living becomes more structured. You wake up in the morning, you daven, you make a blessing before you eat. You make a blessing, you pray in the morning, you pray in the afternoon, you pray in the evening. These benefits not only prepare a person for a personal life of righteousness and decency, but can extend outward to be an example of others of how to act uh, how not to act, and how to change. The guidelines of Jewish living through the study of Torah and performance of mitzvahs allows the prison environment to become utilized in this positive manner. And that is why good quality time is spent by myself and many colleagues who visit prisons each and every week. Indeed, as the Torah teaches, from the darkest moments and the deepest loss can come the greatest light and ultimate gain. Consequently, it is of the utmost importance to make it possible for inmates in physical confinements to transform a period of suspended death, so to speak, to vibrant life, therefore fulfilling their purpose on this world. So the proven way for us to attain this freedom is by involving oneself in a life filled with Torah and observance. Sadly, there are many people who are free, free to, to travel, to go, to make business, but they're really imprisoned. They're imprisoned in their own self, in their own mediocrity, in their own lack of enthusiasm. Our prison systems in America spend much time and money on vocational, academic, and psychological programs. To really accomplish the rehabilitation that is possible in prison, we should also focus on emancipating and structuring the soul as well, maximizing the human potential even while temporarily incarcerating the body. So, I share that with you today because we are celebrating the uh, 
the acquittal 